All right, we are concluding our Place of Hope sermon series today, and I pray that it's been helpful, and not just helpful to you, but transformative uh, for you as we have preached through line by line of our benediction. Uh, the benediction is our closing prayer that we pray at the end of each Sunday morning service. Uh, and I know that the prayer is framed in a way to compel each of us to help in these various areas. You know, violence, poverty, addiction, loneliness. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about overabundance of convenience. Uh, so the prayer compels us to help in these areas. But as I have been preaching this series... I've not been coming at this series from the standpoint of equipping you and I with tools to help people as they struggle in these areas. No, I've actually been working on helping us address these areas in our own life so that we uh, uh, allow God to address the areas of violence, poverty, addiction, loneliness, and overabundance of convenience for us. Because we cannot lead people where we have not traveled. We cannot teach people what we really do not know. And we cannot help others where the Lord has not first helped us. So for you and I to be agents of peace in the midst of a violent world, we must first deal with our own propensities towards violence. We must allow the Holy Spirit to transform us into peacemakers. We must first surrender our tendencies towards greed, hoarding, and selfishness if we are going to help others become generous with what they have. We must allow the Holy Spirit to break chains of addiction in our life. We must be set free if we want to help see God bring freedom to others. And we must first address our own relationship with God, our own aching loneliness, if we have any chance of helping to foster authentic community for others to, that they can benefit from. For us to live out the benediction, it requires that we first walk the path of discipleship. And this leads us to our final line this morning, where there is an overabundance of convenience, teach me to sacrifice. Convenience is the idea of making something easier, something less difficult, to make something more accessible. We normally describe or identify something as convenient when we compare it to something else that we would deem to be more difficult, something that might increase our workload or our effort more. We are looking for something to be convenient for us because we want it to become more comfortable or demand less of our time. The pursuit of convenience is about making things basically just easier and more comfortable. And if we took time to think about it, a large portion of the products that are sold to us that we're pressured to buy and invest in are about increasing our levels of convenience. So I want us to take a moment, and hopefully the feed doesn't get shut down with uh, copyright infringements, but check out this short Simpsons clip that sort of talks about this idea of convenience. Products you could only imagine before. The SS Microwave. Ah, my crepes are done. The Doggy Doorman. Good evening, Rex. And Mobile Ear, the chandelier for your car. <laughs> All on, I can't believe they invented it. Hello, everybody. I'm Troy McClure. Star of such films as P is for Psycho and The President's Neck is Missing. But now I'm here to tell you about a remarkable new invention. Until now, this was the only way to get juice from an orange. You mean there's a better way? But that's all changed, thanks to the juice loosener. Let's meet the inventor, Dr. Nick Riviera. Hello, Troy. Hi, everybody. Hi, Dr. Nick. Troy, would you like a glass of orange juice? I sure would. But won't we have to pay those outrageous grocery store prices for something the farmer probably spit in? Not anymore. All thanks to the new juice loosener. Doctor, are you sure it's on? I can't hear a thing. It's Whisper Quiet. You got all that from one bag of oranges? 
That's right. Order now, and you'll also get Sun and Run, the suntan lotion that's also a laxative. We live in a world that is constantly trying to sell us and push us towards things to make life more convenient for us. Technology, inventions, it seems that it's all centered around this idea of convenience. Uh, I drive a 2001 Toyota Corolla. That's right, you heard me right. It's a 2001 Toyota Corolla. And sometimes whenever we go on long trips as a family, we don't want to take a car that could potentially break down. So it's great to tool around in the city with an older beat up car. So we'll rent a vehicle sometimes. And when we go on a long trip and the amount of modern conveniences that are available within cars today that have nothing to do with getting from point A to point B, but has just like the ability to like have touch screens, maps, I can get internet within the car, like the, the, the sound system, the heated seats, you just name it. I'm just sort of blown away by the modern conveniences. We now have self-driving cars where you could basically sit back and let the car drive itself. The manifestation of the problem of convenience might be less visible and less in our faces, but our desire for and our familiarity with convenience is actually, I believe, one of the largest obstacles that affects our relationship with the Lord and our spiritual growth and maturity here in America. Now, convenience itself is not a bad thing. Hear me, I do not want to demonize convenience in general. I'm actually very thankful for many of the modern conveniences that we have. The fact that we can host church this way, this microphone works, the TV works, everything. That, I mean, we don't want to just look and just say convenience itself is bad. You know, one of the conveniences that I enjoy in life is hot water, access to hot water in my home. There are many places around the world that do not have the ability to just turn on a faucet, turn on a shower, and instantaneously get hot water. I mean, that is a modern convenience that I do not want to live without. So I am not saying that conveniences are bad. What I want to do this morning is I want us to think about what it means for us to have a healthy relationship with convenience. Because if you and I can learn to live with appropriate levels of convenience in our life, discerning when it is helpful for us, but also when it is harmful for us, I believe that is when we will spiritually blossom and bloom like never before. The issue we have, I believe, is that, and this, this is my opinion, is that we live lives centered on convenience. So decisions that we make, everything that we do, we are compelled, pushed, and everything is about making the con easiest and the convenient decision. So the main idea this morning is that convenience is not evil. Hear me, convenience is not evil, but it becomes harmful and even sinful when we give in too much to it or if we embrace it at the wrong time or in the wrong circumstance. So we're going to ask ourselves two questions this morning around the issue of convenience, and the first is this. Am I struggling with the inundation of convenience? Am I struggling with the inundation of convenience? So let's face it, we are inundated with the choice for convenience all of the time. Never before in the history of the world has life been more convenient for us. That's not to say that life isn't hard, life isn't difficult, life isn't painful or unfair. I'm not trying to minimize the struggles that we go through as people, but you and I, we do have to admit that so much of everyday life for us is more convenient than ever before. There are so many options out there available to us that just make day-to-day -day operation so much easier. Microwaves, drive throughs prepared foods, shopping apps like Instacart have just made revolutionize the, the, uh, the need for food to be so convenient for us. Amazon, Target, Walmart, two-day shipping brings all sorts of products right to our doorstep in record time without us ever having to step outside of the house. Computers, phones, the internet make everything so super convenient for us. And I know this is all relative because 200 years from now, our existence 
today is going to be seen as such an immense struggle to those that are living in the future. And they're going to look back at our lives and say, how did those people survive? How did they? They're going to be sitting in their Wally recliners in space, not even having to get out of their chair for anything in life. And they're going to be like, how did those people make it through life? It's hard to say exactly when the tipping point came or where the tipping point is. But it does seem like the widespread availability of convenience and the immense value that we place on it has shifted something in us and in society for the worse. It's as if we've moved into a place where there are just too many convenient options in life, leading to a negative impact on us versus a positive one. Think of it like salt. Salt enhances food with flavor. We need salt. Salt is a good thing, but too much salt becomes problematic in our life. It becomes problematic to our health. And where convenience can be such a valuable asset to us, at some point, it becomes unhealthy, and it leads to a diseased life. Listen to this, which was written in the New York Times in 2018, an op-ed piece called The Tyranny of Convenience. Convenience is the most underestimated and least understood force in the world today. In the developed nations of the 21st century, convenience, that is, more efficient and easier ways of doing personal tasks, has emerged as perhaps the most powerful force shaping our individual lives and our economies. Given the growth of convenience, of convenience as an ideal, as a value, and as a way of life, it is worth asking what our fixation with it is doing to us and to our country. Today's cult of convenience fails to acknowledge that difficulty is a constitutive feature of human experience. Convenience is all destination and no journey. But climbing a mountain is different from taking the tram to the top, even if you end up at the same place. We are becoming people who care mainly or only about outcomes. We are at risk of making most of our life experiences a series of trolley rides. Struggle is not always a problem. Sometimes struggle is a solution. It can be the solution to the question of who you are. This really eloquently describes the problem we face. The pursuit of convenience has emerged as perhaps the most powerful force shaping our lives today. Outcomes becoming more important than the journey. And when we find ourselves in this place, in this type of relationship with convenience, it's become a problem. When we have become conditioned for and we focus so much on having convenience in life, always being able to possess an ability to willingly choose a less convenient path. The inundation of convenience plagues us. The frequency and the widespread availability of it, always at our fingertips, it removes us from being naturally forced onto paths that will teach us to be patient, to struggle, to develop more human ingenuity, creativity, and more. When we grow accustomed to the inundation of convenience, sacrifice becomes that much more difficult and painful for us. Our tolerance for struggle and the ability to show resilience in life wanes and we grow soft. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 13, and we're going to see a story of how this principle illustrates itself in Paul's day. He's writing to the Corinthians, and he says, and I'm going to read this out of the Message Bible because I think that it It it, it reads better for us. It says, Now, friends, I want to report on the surprising and generous ways in which God is working in the churches in Macedonia province. Fierce troubles came down on the people of those churches, pushing them to the very limit. The trial exposed their true colors. They were incredibly happy, though desperately poor. The pressure triggered something totally unexpected, an outpouring of pure and generous gifts. I was there and I saw it for myself. They gave offerings of whatever they could, far more than they could afford, pleading for the privilege of helping out in relief of poor Christians. This was totally spontaneous, entirely their own idea, and caught us completely off guard. What explains it was that they had first given themselves unreservedly to God and to us. 
The other giving simply flowed out of the purposes of God working in their lives. That's what prompted us to ask Titus to bring the relief offering to your attention so that what was so well begun could be finished up. You do so well in so many things. You trust God. You're articulate. You're insightful. You're passionate. You love us. Now do your best in this too. I'm not trying to order you around against your will, but by bringing in the Macedonians' enthusiasm as a stimulus to your love. I am hoping to bring the best out of you. You are familiar with the generosity of our master, Jesus Christ. Rich as he was, he gave it all away for us. In one stroke, he became poor, and we became rich. So here's what I think. The best thing you can do right now is to finish, finish it up, so go to it. Once the commitment is clear, you do what you can, not what you can't. The heart regulates the hands. This isn't so others can take it easy while you sweat it out. No, you're shoulder to shoulder with them all the way. Your surplus matching their deficit, their surplus matching your deficit. In the end, you come out even. So what's going on here in this story is that Paul had written to the Corinthians in, their, in the first letter talking about the famine that was happening in Jerusalem. And he's saying, we need to help out our brothers and sisters in Jerusalem because they're starving right now. And the Corinthians eager said, yeah, let's do it. And Corinth was one of the wealthiest, most convenient places to live in the modern world at the time. They had everything that you could possibly need. They had wealth, they had entertainment, they had culture. They really had it all. And so Paul was excited that the Corinthians wanted to help out. But now he's writing in 2 Corinthians, the second letter, saying, yeah, you had good intentions. You said you wanted to help, but you really haven't done it yet, so let's follow through on that. And you can see he's being super encouraging, saying your heart's in the right place. And then he offers the Macedonians as an example to say, look at what the Macedonian church has done. These guys were going through it. They had nothing. They were put to the task. And out of their poverty and out of their struggle, they graciously gave. Now you, out of your convenience, out of your luxury, out of your comfort, would you give? And it just illustrates the issue of what we deal with when we're struggling with convenience is that there's something in us that just makes it a little bit more difficult to be sacrificial. We're accustomed to and we're used to the lap of luxury. This situation shows how the more accustomed we become to convenience, the harder it is for us to give up our convenience. To live in a society where so many convenient choices are at the right appropriate time and choose the more difficult path. The second question that we want to ask ourselves, the first question is, is am I struggling with the inundation of convenience, always choosing the convenient path, or am I struggling with the idolatry of convenience? And I want us to now turn to 1 Kings chapter 12, and let's look at another story, another scenario that happened in Scripture. And now we have to set the stage. David was king. And then David dies, and then David's son Solomon becomes king. And then after Solomon is king, the kingdom splits into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And you've got Jeroboam uh, reigning in the north, and you have Rehoboam, Solomon's son, reigning in the south. And you have now two uh, competing like, countries within the same nation. And here, you, you, starting in verse 26, the, the text reads, Jeroboam, who's the king in the north, thought to himself, the kingdom will now likely revert to the house of David. If these people go up to offer their sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, they will again give their allegiance to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah. They will kill me and return to King Rehoboam. After seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. And he said to the people, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here's the convenient plea. It is too much for you to travel to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. One he set up in Bethel and the other in Dan. And this became a sin. The people came to worship the one at Bethel and went as far as Dan to worship the other. So Jeroboam is afraid of the people being obedient to God and traveling to Jerusalem for the feasts and for the festivals, which the capital city there, to worship and offer sacrifices at the temple. And he doesn't want his people to go to the southern kingdom. So he says, listen, 
I'm going to create a couple of altars up here in the north, and it's going to be way more convenient for you because you don't have to travel as far. So listen, like, just come to Bethel and come to Dan, and here's the place he tempts his people with convenience. You can stay right here and worship God. If we read even further in the passage, we would see Jeroboam sets up competing feasts to happen in the northern kingdom whenever they should be traveling to Judah to be together as an entire community of people worshiping God because he wants his people to remain where, uh, in the north so he can re- retain his power and his control. Using the allure of convenience, Jeroboam leads the people away from proper worship of God. And when our desire for convenience becomes more powerful than our desire for God, we are guilty of idolatry. And in this story, I want us to focus less about the fact that the Israelites were going to these golden calves to worship, which is idolatry. Like that act in of itself, it it was bringing in pagan elements into their worship. What I want us to focus on is the fact that they were being idolatrous because they were allowing convenience to interfere with them being obedient to the Lord. To live our lives according to the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have to learn to embrace inconvenient living. The thing is is that American Christianity looks almost no different than what it means to live in normal secular society because we as Christians have given in to the idolatry of convenience. Ease and comfort have become our way of life, and we often struggle to avoid a more difficult road. The church itself has become so inundated with this desire for convenience that we have transformed Christianity into a materialistic, consumeristic uh, pursuit. Even down to the fact of how comfortable are the chairs? What are the amenities at the church? Like You can go down the list and you can pick it out. And once again, I'm not saying that all convenience is bad, but when we center our lives around it and when the pursuit of it interferes with the pursuit of God, us refusing to go to the places, be in the places, and be connected to the people that God wants us to be connected to because it's just a little bit too inconvenient for me, we are guilty of the sin of idolatry. When we look at scripture, we see Jesus choosing the inconvenient path. And we can look at it truly with a a, a real path when he said, I need to go to Jerusalem. And his disciples were saying, are you crazy? If we go to Jerusalem, they're going to kill you probably. And Jesus says, I need to go. God was propelling him. God the Father was saying, now is the time. Jesus needed to walk the way of the cross. He willingly went to Jerusalem. He willingly embraced the cross. He knew what was going to happen to him. He could have taken a path of least resistance, but he didn't do it. Paul did the same thing, where Paul said, I need to go to Jerusalem, and the, 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 the others were like, are you crazy? They, you go to Jerusalem, and that's not going to be good for you. And it wasn't. that Paul going to Jerusalem, willingly choosing to go, is what led him ultimately on the road to Rome and death. Jesus has told us that we're going to have to pick up a cross to follow him, which means we have to learn to willingly make inconvenient decisions. This is a problem of trying to follow God in the midst of such wealth and in the midst of such uh, uh, luxury, is that when there's so many convenient choices and paths available to us, we have to be willing to choose an inconvenient path. We have to be willing to make dangerous and risky moves when we feel and sense the call of Jesus. There's no way around this. It's a call to faith. This means it's going to affect how we use our money. It's going to affect where we live. Think about that. For most of us, we want to live in the best place we can possibly live with the best education for our kids, with the best safety for us. But to willingly make a choice to live somewhere that, we, that is a bit more inconvenient for us, I mean, we're not even trained to be thinking that way. We're always trying to figure out, like, well, what's just best for me and my family? Not really even contemplating at times the call of God and where he wants us to serve, where he wants us to go, where he wants us to root ourselves. Some of us this morning, God might be calling us to root ourselves in inconvenient places, even though we have the resources and the ability to be in a more convenient place for ourselves and for our family. 
But that's what the gospel is all about. We have to be able to discern what the Holy Spirit is calling us to do, and we have to be able to say no to something that feels and is more convenient for us when God is saying, I want you to walk this more resistant path. Learning to overcome our idolatry of convenience, it's going to affect our job and career. We're not going to just make decisions based on when I'm, where am I going to make the most money? What's going to give me the most power? What's going to give me the most influence? We're going to make our decisions based on God's call on our life and where God has placed us and where he wants us to serve and the people that he wants us to impact. And maybe the salary is lower. Maybe the hours are longer. Maybe the commute is farther. I don't know, but it's going to become inconvenient for us to follow Jesus. It'll affect who we're in a relationship with, who we marry, if we even choose to marry. It'll affect our opportunities for children, if we're going to have children, how many children we're going to have. Like, we're going to be thinking and praying these things and saying, Lord, lead, lead me according to your path and according to your will. And if what you have for me causes more inconvenience in my life, I'll still say yes. It could affect who ends up in our home, sleeping on our couch, living in our spare room. It could affect where we spend our time, how we spend our time, who we spend our time with. When we begin to unravel and detach ourselves, remove ourselves from the idolatry of convenience, all of a sudden new possibilities and a new way of living begins to open up for us. And yes, life could be more difficult. Life could be a little bit harder for us. There could be just a, a more of a struggle. There could be more pain and there could be more sacrifice. But there is nothing more rewarding than following Jesus and being in his will and doing things that he is calling us to do. Convenience isn't bad, but our obsession with it is. If I could just sum up the message in that two cent quick sentences, I'll say it again. Convenience isn't bad, but our obsession with it is. The difficult question that we have to be willing to answer and confront within ourselves is this. Do I love convenience more than I love Jesus? Because the two are going to come to a head with each other where Jesus is going to ask us to do something that is going to be inconvenient. And we are going to be willing, we are going to have options available to us at our fingertips to say no to Jesus and to say yes to something more convenient. And it is going to be a test that we are going to find ourselves in. And the question is, is do I love convenience more than I love Jesus? Is the pull towards convenience stronger than the pull towards the Lord? Because as I said, they will regularly come in conflict with each other. God doesn't just fit himself into our schedules. He disrupts our schedules. God doesn't just conveniently fit into our lives where we want him to fit into our lives. God demands first priority and full access to everything. So where do we start in terms of addressing our issues with convenience? Jeremy, you've done a great job, hope, hopefully I've done a great job, of laying out the problem, the issue. Well, how do I break away? How do I, what do, you, what do I do? What, what are ways for me to like remove myself from the inundation of convenience and from the idolatry of convenience? I'm going to offer a few very practical tips. And the first tip I'm going to give is this. Faithful church attendance. Now, I know that it could easily come across like, Jeremy, you just want me to come to church and like, just hear me on this. Corporately gathering with the people of God to worship, it's obedience, right? This is obedience to God. And then protecting that schedule to where we don't let things interfere with it, that becomes inconvenient. Now, I'm not saying that you don't get to go on vacation or that you never can miss, but average church attendance right now with American Christians is between one to two times a month. That's where we're at right now. And I can guarantee you that you will find life more inconvenient if you protected the 10 to 12 time on Sunday morning and said, I'm not going to let anything interfere with that. That's protected space. God comes first. Nothing interferes with that. So if it's my kid's soccer game, well, my kid doesn't go to the soccer game. If it's uh, an event where I can go with friends to a sporting event, I'm going to say no to it. Like, all of a sudden, like, choosing, willingly choosing... To live a certain way where all of a sudden, by just protecting that time, life's going to become more inconvenient for us. 
You know, I might not want to wake up in the morning. It might feel like it's too early. I had a late night on Saturday night. So the, but the struggle of like, but just to make a commitment, and it doesn't just have to be church attendance, but really like find something that's really important of value that God calls us to and protect that and don't let anything interfere with that on the schedule. And you'll begin to find yourself needing to break away from the idolatry and the inundation of convenience. The second thing I would say is tithe. Now, once again, it could easily be construed as, oh, Jeremy just wants me to give money to the church. Really, this whole message is about Jeremy building his empire. That's not what's happening here, okay? This is, this is faithful obedience to God in the sense that God calls us to give of every, all the resources that he's given to us to give back to him first. So my family practices tithing, which is giving 10% of our, our income first to God. And you know what that means is there, yes, there are less resources for me to spend on things that I just maybe that I want. We have to budget better. We have to say, make, say no to certain things. or like it, it, it creates an inconvenience, but at the same time, it's creating an, obedient, an obedience to God that's unleashing maturity, growth, and discipleship in me. So I know it's hard to do. It, it, it maybe we're not at a place where we're able to just jump right to 10% of our giving, but maybe there's a place where we start where it's like, I'm going to give X amount of dollars, and I'm going to increase that and grow that. I'm telling you, if you want to break away from the idolatry of convenience, tithing is a great practice to incorporate. So let me also break away from offering you ideas that can easily be seen as self-interest on my part because I'm talking about church attendance and tithing. Learn a hobby or skill that forces you into learning more about process than result, right? This is, this will really help in terms of breaking us away from uh, relying upon and our obsession with convenience. Learn something, could be woodworking, knitting, it could be building like a computer or I don't know, but like learn something that teaches us about process than just about being able to benefit from, the, from somebody else doing the process. To where we have to spend our time and our energy sort of like working at it, building it, growing it, like putting effort, like, like build a car versus just buy a car. You know what I'm saying? Like just like that'll begin to teach us to break away. And, and, and I'm not saying that we have to do all of these things. I'm just saying that we need to be able to be able to do some of these things so that we're not always just benefiting from the results of the work, but we're actually putting the work in. Another, uh, another thing is try to repair something before you replace it. Like, attempt it. Try it. See if you can figure it out. Like, struggle through it work at it. I, and I know that it might be just so easy to be like, yeah, but it's, it's only X amount of dollars on Amazon, and I can just replace that part, throw the old one away. I get it. I'm not saying one's right or one's wrong, but like, find a way to immerse yourself into the struggle of something. Another thing we can do is growth something. H having a garden will teach us to break away, like, instead of just buying all of our produce from the grocery store, if we're growing it and having to spend the time to nurture, to tend to it, and, like, put that work, like, it's more inconvenient to do that versus being able to just go out and purchase it. Volunteer regularly. Like, give of yourself, sacrifice, use your time for the benefit of others to where it's not about you and how you're benefiting from that, but you're serving others. And then finally, pray. Obviously, prayer, like, if we're struggling with the idolatry of convenience, man, we need to pray for the Lord to break those desires, to break those chains, to, 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 to like, really release a new perspective and a new mindset in us that helps us to more willingly want to embrace a path of resistance. Once we start learning, once we start regularly choosing paths that are less convenient for us, we will actually discover gifts and joys that accompany the pain, the discomfort, and the struggle. I know I talked about growing something, but there's nothing better than eating a tomato that you've grown in your own garden versus buying one at the grocery store. There's way more struggle in that. There's way more uh, effort. There's way more time. There's way more patience that we need to exert. But there is joys, there's gifts, and there's rewards of not always going the convenient route. We'll be developing new skills, and we'll learn to become more creative with what we have. There are benefits that come from breaking free from the inundation of convenience and the idolatry to it. 
but we don't do it for just the gifts and the rewards. We do it because Jesus calls us to it. Because following Jesus is just not convenient. The two things just are not compatible with each other. If you have found a way to comfortably follow Jesus, I would argue that you have deceived yourself and you're not following him at all. And I know that's a harsh statement to make, but I'm going to stand by that statement. Following Jesus, for me personally, has been the most inconvenient thing in life for me. I can personally attest to the path that my life has taken, the choices that I have made, the things that I have done. Man, God has not led me down the easiest paths in life. But guess what? When we follow Jesus, it's fulfilling. It's a wild ride. It's an adventure. But it is so rewarding to know that our life is being lived out with the purpose and the meaning that God has given to it. If you are not yet embracing the inconveniences in life, learning when it's appropriate to say no to the convenient path and choosing the inconvenient path because God is leading us down, I ask you to join me this morning in living life that way. Will you lay your life down and surrender it fully to God and allow him to be the one that leads us and allow him to be the one that guides us in our decision making? Will you be willing to stop allowing ease and comfort to be the things that dictate the choices that you and I make in life? Evaluating all these decisions and then just saying, I'm always going to choose the most comfortable one. If you can willingly choose to say no to convenience as God calls us to something more difficult, more painful, and more sacrificial, I guarantee that we will find that our relationship with God will grow, our spiritual maturity will deepen, and our fulfillment in life is going to blossom. And we will find that our contentment in life matters more than the conveniences of life. And I end with that phrase one more time. Let me say that again. You and I will find that contentment in life matters more than convenience in life. Let's pray this morning. Our gracious Heavenly Father, would you break us from the inundation and the idolatry of convenience? Lord, would you free us, Lord, from our enslavement to ease and comfort? And Lord, we know that and we're thankful for many of the conveniences that we have, but Lord, we do not need to be obsessed with convenience. We need to have a healthy relationship with it. And that means putting you first, prioritizing you, and walking the difficult paths that you call us to walk. Willingly being willing to, being willing to lay our lives down and choose things, people, places that, that just make life harder for us. That's what it means to live by faith. That's what it means to pick up our cross and follow you. Lord, some of us have so much ease and comfort in our lives, but we're so unfulfilled. And life feels so meaningless. Because the more we seek out comfort, the more we seek out ease, the more we seek out convenience, we're just not finding more fulfillment in that. Lord, would you just reorient our minds and our hearts to seek you first and not to seek our own comfort and ease. Let us follow you. Let us walk the road that leads into the valley. Let us walk the road that leads us up the steep mountain cliff. Lord, let us, let us follow you into the places that seem dark and seem dangerous and seem risky and, and just seem like that there's the fright and peril and the possibility for failure. Lord, may we choose those paths. Lead us away from the inundation of convenience and the idolatry of it. And let us fully embrace and follow you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.